Okay, so this is, uh, I think, officially the halfway point of the workshop. So, then take a deep breath. You're over the halfway point. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Very good. Okay, so um, I wanted to uh, to begin with um, this really quite interesting um, statement. Nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And, and this was coined by uh, a famous evolutionary biologist, uh, Fidoza Stobzanski, uh, in the 70s. It was really kind of in response to uh, uh, educational policies in the US. Um, but I would like to just state that um, the same is true when we think about cancer biology. So, uh, and, and really, this has a historical context, and, I, and I've already talked about Bovary and, 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 and Noel and Hungerford. And people have been thinking about cancer as evolutionary systems uh, for 100 years. Uh, but, um, but really, we've lacked the measurement technology, um, I think, to, to be able to profile evolution in cancers. And, and I think we're getting to the to very exciting time uh, in trying to discern patterns of evolution in cancer. And, um, and, and, we'll, and so this is really, um, this idea has been synthesized in a, in a seminal paper 40 years ago by, by Peter Knoll, who, who was one of the co-discoverers of, of the Philadelphia chromosome. And he placed uh, cancer progression in the context of a phylogenetic tree. So if you think back to your um, high school biology, uh, you may have seen a phylogenetic tree that, de that describes the ancestral relationships between species um, over evolutionary time. Well, one can actually cast uh, a cancer uh, in a very similar context where we have a transition from a, a normal, uh, a normal uh, cell and, uh, and, and there's an acquisition of, of some sort of uh, genetic mutation uh, that transforms that cell to a malignant state. And that, that uh, clone, we call a clonal expansion, is a population of cells that have identical genotype, um, can then uh, expand in different ways. So different cells can then, through stochastic processes, acquire additional mutations. And, and that leads to this branching process. And this uh, theory, which is very elegant theory, uh, predicts certain very, very important features of, of tumors. And the first is that uh, tumors change over time. We all probably appreciate that. Um, and then acquisition of mutations actually leads to uh, phenotypic changes that may, in certain cir cir circumstances, uh, confer selective advantages in clonal expansions. So you can imagine, uh, in the context of, uh, of therapy, where you've got a population of cells uh, with different underlying genotypes, you put the selective pressure of chemotherapy on that cell, will drive that population through an evolutionary bottleneck, and what emerges on the other side may be, you know, a very rare clone that was in existence prior to treatment, but is the thing that expands and ultimately maybe kills the patient um, later on. So, so understanding how this process works uh, is really critical to, uh, to gaining insight into um, whether cells are, are sensitive to chemotherapy or resistant. Um, uh, and, and the mechanisms why. So, uh, so the, the other important aspect of this is that uh, we have uh, a, a way of interpreting mutations in the context of this tree. So this theory really assumes that um, mutations that are born at a certain part uh, at a certain time are actually propagated to their descendant clones. Okay, so every time you have a cell division, those mutations will be passed on to their descendants. And so uh, the clones that are born at, at this point in the tree actually carry all of the mutations that will be present uh, in that initial clonal expansion. And so that tells us something about um, when in the process a mutation was acquired and its, its potential for being uh, responsible, for example, for tumorigenic um, initiation in the first place. Uh, so, so casting uh, cancers in this evolutionary framework has, has a lot of advantages. So one thing that's important to, to consider then is that we may have um, 
at diagnosis, a, a mosaic of, of, of cells that look something like that. And the colors represent um, different underlying genotypes. So you have different populations of cells with different genotypes. And, and over time, that, that may actually transform into something like this, especially if you have a, uh, a selective pressure in here that uh, then drives those cells through, through an evolutionary bottleneck that has some advantages for this green population. Uh, but but maybe it uh, kills the the other populations. So uh, so so this this has uh, major implications for how we might use uh, somatic mutations to study uh, tumors and how they progress. Any questions on this? Okay. So so we need to think about cancers um, in this way, and uh, and and then all of the genetic abnormalities that we're studying and trying to interpret. Um, will will make sense uh, from the, it will, from this perspective. Otherwise, um, so if you think about this statement, so you, you, well, sometimes when we sequence or, or measure a genome, uh, there's a lot of chaos that goes on, and and so uh, to interpret it uh, in the light of evolution uh, it is very very helpful. So another way to look at this is that you have this this population cells. Here the cells are colored according to the genotype and. And we really want to have these fundamental questions ar 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 arise in this context. Do, do these clonal genotypes actually um, drive different phenotypic behaviors? And, and very importantly, from a clinical perspective, is how this relates to treatment, response, progression, metastasis, et cetera. And, and so this has been discussed in, in numerous different venues. Um, we've done some of the early work in terms of profiling uh, primary metastatic tumors and comparing their mutational profiles to really measure evolution. Uh, and there have been some review papers now that have come out. This is a particularly good one uh, from, from Vogelstein that, that really talked about how um, the, the different levels of um, how uh, clonal populations um, can distribute in, in different patients and also within a patient. So uh, this is a decent review to, uh, to look at that. This was a seminal paper that came out in, in 2012 um, that whereby um, this group, this is Charlie Swanton's group at, uh, at, at UCL in London, did uh, perform multi-region sampling of uh, renal cell carcinomas. So they looked at the primary site um, here and then uh, multiple metastatic deposits um, throughout uh, the pleural cavity and then sequenced the exomes of each of these uh, lesions. And, and, and what they found is, uh, is that there were a core set of mutations that were shared everywhere. These really represent that trunk of the tree, if you will. Okay, so this is the first set of mutations that gave rise to a clonal expansion. Uh, but then, uh, over time, each uh, sample diverged in a way that uh, where they acquired um, uh, new mutations, and these can be um, viewed as descendant clones. So if you think about this is the trunk of the tree, these would be closer to the leaves of the tree. Okay? So this has many implications. Um, most importantly, I think, in the clinical domain is that uh, each one of those rows represent a, a, a piece of tissue that could have been biopsied for, let's say, a clinical assay. And each one of those rows has a different mutational profile. So if you want to say something, you want to make a conclusion about a particular patient and their tumor, uh, sampling from just one place will definitely give an incomplete representation of the genomic profile uh, of, that, of that particular tumor. So, uh, so this has, uh, I think, really, really uh, critical, important Im implications. Yes? Did they identify the uh, genes that were different to be driver genes? Or yeah, so, so that's the part of the claim of, um, of this mutation. So here you have, for example, there's a, there's, there are two independent P10 mutations um, in two different branches of the, of the tree. And, and so here's a missense mutation. Here's the splice set mutation. They're, they're, what they're, they're claiming is that that's actually an example of, um, of convergent evolution, if you will, or, whereby different branches of the tree acquire different mutations, uh, but in the same gene. But no, nonetheless, um, it's after uh, that, that driver mutation is, is acquired after uh, the expansion of the initial clone. So it's not a tumorigenic event, but it, it is obviously still important. 
Yes. Uh, here, there is no single gene that is muted in all the samples. Did they exclude those? Uh, no, this, this block here. The gray here means mutated. Yeah, it's a kind of a funny color scheme they picked, but yeah, it's it's the opposite of what you'd expect. In in in, in in our in our paper, we flipped this around. So we have a paper in uh, that came out soon after this in ovarian cancer, and um, never understood why they colored it this way, but they did. Um, okay, so the blue is actually the empty and. The gray is where you have a mutation. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so this in, this induces the. So I'm glad you raised that question because it actually invokes this concept of driver versus passenger mutation. So, um, so who wants to take a stab at defining what a driver mutation is without looking at the notes? Uh -huh. Yeah. Driver mutation is a mutation that confers selective advantage. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah. So I think those two those two things that you just said are the most important. So selective advantage and phenotype. Um, because phenotyping implies that there are some different characteristics that are um, that are associated with that or caused even by that particular mutation. And then um, whether selection acts on those characteristics or not is probably a, the ultimate arbiter of whether that mutation is actually having an impact. And so, uh, and, there, and f those phenotypes can be different things. They can be transformation from a normal cell to a malignant cell. They can be um, acquisition of metastatic potential. So you could have cells that are uh, in the primary tumor and then some, some cells might acquire ability to migrate and invade. That's a phenotypic advantage. Different phenotypic advantage may be um, upregulation of, uh, uh, of, a, uh, of a drug pump that allows cells to pump out um, toxins and therefore becomes immune to, uh, to chemotherapy. So there are all kinds of different ways by which um, a phenotype can be changed. And, and depending on the selective pressure, uh, that what expands out, uh, I think, has, has some bearing on, on what happens. So, so uh, and then the other, I think, really uh, important concept is, is the, <coughs> if one, when one studies traits in, in species, um, the, the ultimate description of a phenotype is when you have independent uh, um, evolution of that same trait, let's say in geographically separated continents. Um, that suggests that uh, this idea of convergent evolution is quite important. And so, uh, you know, many groups are now starting to see that uh, there are, um, along the branches of a tree, one can acquire mutations um, in the same gene but in independent clones. And that's a really strong uh, measure of selection because then you have selection operating in independently twice and, and selecting for the same type of mutation. Uh, and so that, that I think, is, is a really important concept to get across as well. Um, <clears throat> so that's a driver mutation. And, uh, and then passenger mutations <clears throat> are generally considered as benign. And, uh, and then it's just the opposite of that. So, so they do not alter the phenotype of the cell, and so selection can't really operate on, on passenger mutations because there aren't, um, there, there aren't uh, phenotypes to, 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 um, to select. So, and, and passenger mutations, as we've discussed a little bit this morning, they can be re the result of a particular uh, mutator phenotype. So, if, uh, again, a, a tumor with a mismatch repair deficiency will accumulate many, many point mutations. Most of those are probably just going to be completely benign. The vast majority will, won't be doing anything. It's just a result of compromised ability to repair those uh, misincorporations of nucleotides during um, cell replication. Uh, and similarly, uh, translocations that accrue in, in cells with homologous recombination deficiencies, they will just accrue. And, and, and so, um, you may not have, uh, they may not have any biological effect as well. It's just a result of, of, um, of, of repair through, through non-homologous end joining, for example. Okay, so, uh, so these, uh, this is an important concept, and you'll hear it over and over again. You probably already know about this stuff. So um, let's think about 
uh, these different types of driver mutations. And, and really, this invokes the idea that driver mutations can have a temporal aspect to them. So it's not just the tumor initiating type of mutations. Um, over cancer progression, these mutations can then lead to uh, important phenotypic <coughs> changes, such as um, acquisition of metastatic potential. And, and this is a this gives this paper here gives a very nice little overview of, of of mutations that are known to, for example, confer chemotherapeutic resistance, and and the classic example is is in um, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, um, acquisition of of KIT mutations confer resistance. Uh, in gastrointestinal tumors, and and also uh, and, and then this classic uh, EGFR uh, codon seven ninety mutation. Uh, g gives rise to resistance in uh, lung cancers that are treated for tyrosine, uh, with tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So, <clears throat> um, so I think uh, the the role of a driver mutation, just to, just to be clear, can have a temporal aspect. It can be a tumorigenic driver, can be a driver of chemotherapeutic resistance, it can be a driver of metastatic potential. Okay, and and where these mutations are placed on that phylogenetic tree, um, we can start to infer what type of mutation these, these might actually be, uh, which type of driver mutations they are. So, uh, so given all this information, uh, we're all probably engaged, uh, you wouldn't be sitting here if you weren't engaged in some level of, of probably sequencing or, uh, or analysis of, of cancer genomes. So, so this is that the classic Hanahan and Weinberg uh, paper in cell that really describe these um, hallmarks of cancer, and, and these you could you could think of as phenotypes of cancer. Uh, these are the phenotypes that are shared by almost all malignancies, and uh, what was uh, glaringly absent from this is how these phenotypes are acquired, and and it almost invariably is to do with changes in the genome, and and that can be through mutation, copy number, even epigenetic change, etc. Um, with some exception of, of viral um, uh, exogenous factors like viruses that come in and, and drive malignancies, but for the vast majority, uh, it's changes in the genome. And so, uh, naturally, uh, sequencing um, the cancer genomes will, will give us insights into their biology. And, um, and there's some major initiatives underway, like the TCJ, where the first phase is lar largely complete, um, and then the International Cancer Genome Consortium, which is um, uh, for which this institute here is, is, is heavily involved in. And, uh, and, and so we will likely see somewhere in the order of 100,000 cancer samples sequenced to some degree uh, in the next five years deposited in, in databases. So that's a huge amount of data um, for which we will gain, um, I think, tremendous insights into, um, into cancer biology. Um, so here's just a synthesis of, of this in action. So this is a paper that came out at the end of uh, last year that uh, was really describing the pan-cancer analysis of the initial phase of the TCGA. And what this figure here shows is essentially um, the, uh, the frequency of mutation in 127 genes that uh, were found to be um, more mutated than you'd expect by chance. In, uh, in, in these populations of, of different tumor types. So we have uh, uh, bladder cancer, breast cancer, um, colorectal cancer, AML, lung cancer, ovarian, uh, and, and uterine as well. So, so there's a whole spectrum of mutations. And, and then so here, um, unsurprisingly, is, uh, is P53. So uh, this is the most mutated gene in, in the human cancer genome. Um, and it is, a, it is the, the, the cancer tumor suppressor. Um, and then you have PI3 kinase mutation over here uh, that's uh, associated with uh, uterine cancers. And, uh, and for example, here um, you have the APC uh, gene, which is highly mutated in colorectal cancers. Um, and so this gives you a really nice overview of, uh, of the types of biological processes which are impacted in different cancer types. And, um, and, and I think what, one of the really surprising things that came out of this, and we wouldn't have known this had we not sequenced, the, had the community not sequenced this number of tumors, is that um, biological processes such as histone modification and even uh, pre-mRNA splicing are implicated in a number of different tumor types. 
And these are global processes of genome integrity and also, uh, also obviously in protein um, generation integrity uh, that you would expect that if you, you actually aberrated those processes, that that would lead to deleterious phenotype and those cells would just die uh, because they're such core processes. But in a number of tumors now, we see histone modification as, uh, as a major contributor uh, to, uh, to the cancer biology. And, it, and one, can, one starts to think of this uh, as very analogous to DNA repair abnormalities because you've got uh, the ability then to really manipulate the 3D conformation of how the genome is packed in the cell, and that has downstream impacts on transcription. So, so this is, uh, I think, a really uh, important um, uh, result in the sense that whole new sets of, of biology has been revealed through uh, mutational analysis in, uh, in large sets of, of tumors. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so the clinical um, utility of, uh, of, of, of cancer genome sequencing is, is just, I think, um, beginning to bear fruit. Uh, there are a number of parallel efforts uh, in, in both uh, industry and in academia to reduce this type of thing down to practice, whereby we could uh, develop panels of genes to sequence in the context of clinical care that could then be used to inform whether a particular therapy would be useful in a patient. And, uh, and so, so this idea of companion diagnostics has already been well uh, described, so EGFR mutations uh, uh, elicit um, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, uh, BRAF uh, V600E mutations, for example, in melanoma, uh, have uh, been used to, as a companion diagnostic to, uh, to administer, uh, I can never pronounce his name, it's the, the bimafurinib, bimafurinib, I don't know. Somebody, some people can, it rolls off the tongue, not for me. Um, anyways, it's a very difficult name to describe. But, um, but it, these are, this is a target inhibitor against, um, against this particular mutation. Happens in 70% of melanomas and, uh, and is essentially, um, uh, elicits, often elicits a, a response, uh, but then uh, there's, there's typically a, a relapse associated uh, later on because there's probably, a, it probably uh, induces a massive selective pressure to uh, select for resistant clones. Um, so, uh, so this is, um, you know, this has really, had really great promise in the beginning uh, because it was showing uh, really incredible responses, but those responses typically are not durable. So, so we want responses to be, have, to be durable. And, uh, and, and so, the problem with these targeted inhibitors, generally speaking across the board, has been that they select for resistant clones. So uh, it's, it's just evolution outwits us in that regard. Um, and then we have, um, again, markers of, of resistance to therapy. So I already mentioned secondary EGFR mutations. And this is very likely what's happening in these um, uh, BRAF inhibitors as well. So here's a nice website where you can go to get um, uh, a list of targeted therapies against uh, known mutations, and uh, so I recommend checking that out. The, there's a very exciting development in the world of ovarian cancer, which are associated with um, homologous recombination deficiency. So there's a class of new drugs called PARP inhibitors, and, um, and they... Uh, as I said, they work in a synthetic lethal capacity in patients' uh, tumors whereby uh, uh, homologous recombination is, is impaired. And uh, this is really transforming the field because there have been no real pr developments uh, in high-grade serous ovarian cancer, which is the most lethal gynecologic malignancy that we have. The outcomes haven't changed in 30 years. It's really astonishing. I mean, it's, it's really <laughs> Really, really remarkable. You think about all the progress that's happened. That disease is still um, something that we can't um, come to grips with. But this new class of drugs, uh, and I think um, AstraZeneca has applied for um, uh, uh, approval, will we'll be applying for approval at the FDA in September uh, for their, their compound, Olaparib. And so, but we need to know 
uh, whether homologous recombination is actually defective in, in those patients before administering the drug, because otherwise it won't work. And uh, what's been there have been incidences of uh, really remarkable mutations that are acquired. So ovarian cancer, 20% of ovarian cancers are associated with germline BRCA deficiencies. So they have a, uh, uh, it's the same gene that um, was made famous by Angelina Jolie, who did her hereditary test and decided to do some surgical prevention. Um, and, uh, and, and so, in fact, it's, it's much more of a, uh, uh, ovarian cancer is much more of a BRCA uh, disease than breast cancer is. But, but it doesn't get its day in the sun, it needs to. Um, so, so I'll just plug uh, the need for to study ovarian cancer, uh, but but nonetheless. So, so what's really interesting about this is that in in, in rare cases, women with germline frame shifting BRCA mutations, uh, the tumors acquire additional somatic mutations that restore the reading frame. So this again speaks to the temporal nature of a of a driver gene. So, uh, so that may be. That, that deficient BRCA gene may be very responsible for tumor genesis, but then uh, through either through uh, selective pressure induced by therapy, um, the, the tumor restores capacity to repair uh, those, that, that process in, in a subpopulation of patients. So, uh, so knowing that uh, in, the, in the context of administering PARP, PARP inhibitors is very important. Okay. All right. So, so what we're talking about here, now let's just get into the actual data, um, is our somatic point mutations. And this is, this is an actual sequence from a, a P53 um, uh, bearing tumor. This is a triple negative breast cancer that has a G to T substitution at this particular locus. And that induces a uh, premature stop codon and so, uh, and results in loss of function of that, of that protein in that cell. And so, uh, I've already mentioned that P53 is a tumor suppressor gene, and, and it's essentially, it's involved in programmed cell death, and it's involved in DNA repair, and a number of other sort of core processes. Uh, it's probably the most well-studied gene uh, in the human genome uh, from the cancer perspective. Um, and it imp gets implicated in all kinds of biological processes because, because of that. Um, so, uh, so, given that we're talking about these point mutations, there are a number of different classes. So, uh, one can think about a missense mutation. This is a single base substitution uh, that alters the amino acid sequence of a protein. So, uh, so here you have incorporation of an A to C change, and that changes uh, this amino acid to, uh, to this amino acid here. Um, we can have silent mutations in the coding space that are called synonymous mutations. These are single base substitutions that don't change the amino acid sequence of a protein. So uh, if one were to place their bet on uh, which one would be a driver G mutation versus uh, a passenger mutation, you'd, you'd make the assumption that the missense mutations are probably mo much more likely to be driver mutations. There are now reports, though, of many silent mutations that actually have uh, uh, eff effect. And, and this can be through induction of uh, cryptic splice sites uh, or through um, other type of um, regulatory impact. So if you have, uh, you have an excellent sequence that actually doubles as, a, as an enhancer or promoter, um, changing that sequence can have an impact as well. Then we have uh, nonsense mutations, which are called truncating mutations, and these are uh, single base substitutions that in introduce a premature stop codon. And then you can have uh, frame shifting uh, mutations where you have actually uh, uh, removal or insertion of uh, additional genetic material that usually uh, ends up resulting in a premature stop codon because you change the reading frame of that, of that transcript. Okay? So these are the major classes of point mutations. Um, that you'll see. And uh, so here's an example of a, of a missense mutation uh, that we discovered, and uh, it's uh, in a rare form of ovarian cancer called uh, granulosa cell tumors, the ovary. Uh, and, and this is actually found just by sequencing. Um, I wouldn't recommend that this is the way that things are done, but, but this is actually sequencing transcriptomes. And we noticed that there is uh, a common uh, substitution at the same locus in, uh, in four cases. And that induced a, um, uh, a cysteine to tryptophan uh, uh, amino acid change. And, 
and what was really quite interesting about this gene is that it is uh, involved in gran granulosa cell differentiation, and that was only just discovered right around the time where we found this mutation. So, so we did some literature search, and, and there's a paper that emerged, and, and it all made sense. It, it fit. And, uh, and so then we went and um, looked at a large series of these cases by trolling tumor banks across the country and across the world, and found that in almost all cases, they harbored a somatic mutation that's exactly the same mutation. So it is the pathognomonic mutation that, d that defines the disease, uh, and, and it is the, the, the transformative event in the disease. It's very likely that in my career I'll never see anything like this again. <laughs> Uh, it's just was a lucky hit, and but but is is the kind of most extreme example of um, of a mutation that's driving a phenotype. It's one base change changes the phenotype, creates the malignancy. It's now used as a diagnostic in multiple different countries, and and people are starting to develop therapeutics against it. So, um, uh, virtually all, but. But it's somewhere in, we've found it in 95%. Yeah. I expect the, the rest are false negatives or, or misdiagnosis. Yeah. So these missense mutations can um, often uh, occur in, in hot spots in a gene. So this is a, uh, I mentioned PI3 kinase mutations is involved in phospho AKT signaling. And, um, and, and its character, mutations in this gene tend to cluster in two different places. So one is at the 1047 locus, uh, one is at the 545, 542 locus, uh, and, and these, uh, um, these are the, the, the places where, um, where you expect to see these mutations. So uh, if you were to just design an assay to look for PI3 kind of mutations, you could probably just look at those two hotspots, and that would get you 95% of PI3 kinase mutations that, that are uh, active in the, in the cell. And so um, there are other well-known examples like this where you have KRAS codon 12 uh, in, in pancreatic cancer, um, and, and I've already mentioned the BRAF V600E mutations in melanoma. When, when these mutations occur in BRAF, and they're always at, always at 600. It's always the same one. So, uh, so these can be really useful because they can be used as diagnostics and, and also indicate, as I said, um, whether a patient should be put on a particular therapy. So, so these are the, what we call activating or oncogenic mutations. Um, so, all right, I don't think I need to go over this. Uh, so, so here's where PI3 kinase sits in, uh, in, in the signaling pathway. So, uh, so here you have AKT. And that drives um, uh, all of the cell cycle progression um, uh, downstream growth signaling patterns. And so uh, you disrupt the pathway at this place, and it has a cascading effect through AKT down all of these different processes. Okay. Good. So in contrast to that, um, this is the typical pattern that you might see in a tumor suppressor gene. Uh, so this is a discovery we made uh, in, in uh, clear cell cancers or endometriosis-associated ovarian cancers. And uh, so what you see here is the mutation. This is the protein that's shown here, and this is the, basically the amino acid that's, um, that's hit by all these different mutations. And, and generally speaking, these are, um, these are stop codon mutations or frame shifting mutations. So when you see a pattern like this across a population of tumors, um, it's almost certainly a strong indicator that that's a tumor suppressor gene because you have multiple ways of inactivating it. Uh, and, and often you see this. And so you'll see this pattern, uh, characteristic pattern in P P53. You'll see it in, uh, in RB. Uh, you'll see it in P10. Yeah. So there's several mutations here. Yeah. How, do you know how recurrent any one of them is? Or they no, are they not recurrent? Well, so that's, that's the point, is that this is the recurrent by gene here, not by, not, not by locus. So in some cases, there'll be, there'll be locus. Uh, there'll be some, recurrent by Yeah, gene. because there are some places, there are only some places where you can actually get a truncated mutation, right? So, so the amino acid sequence has to be such that, um, or the, the, the mRNA sequence has to be such that you can actually induce a stop codon, and that's limited to a, a 
a, a restricted set of positions. But right. So then my question is that if you run this through, if you're looking at a number of patients looking for ARID 1A mutation and running the significantly a software that would look at significantly mutated genes, will this show up? Oh yeah. It will. Sure. Because that, that, that software, what it does is essentially will look at, um, in, in some region of the genome, it could be a gene or uh, uh, what is the likelihood that we would see this many mutations in that region. It's not base pair specific, it's the region specific. So they don't have to be recurrent? At the same point, no. They're recurrent by gene, though. They have to be recurrent by gene to become significant. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and so then often we see the other thing about this is this is where now integration of copy number changes comes in. So we often see these uh, uh, these types of mutations will be co-occurring with a loss of heterozygosity, or if um, a patient doesn't have a, a, a mutation, then they may have a homozygous deletion, for example, of that gene. Uh, so so that's again where um, different t types of biological features can be um, brought in. Uh, and we see similar patterns for P53, BRCA1, BRCA2. I'm sorry, what do you think is the reason for this loss of function pattern if you have multiple of these mutations? Is it that you're creating some kind of range shift and stop codons operate at a different level? Yeah, so sorry, I should mention that each one of these dots is from a different tumor, right? So um, so this is just the population level synthesis of this data. So each, each dot here um, is from, from a different tumor. And so it, it basically suggests that one, one can inactivate this gene in many different ways. And as long as that gene is inactivated, the phenotype is, gets, is what gets selected for. Yeah, what so, so this is a gene involved in the sweet sniff uh, complex. And it's another one of these uh, histone modification, chromatin modification type of processes. And so uh, in these endometriosis associated ovarian cancers, some, something about disrupting chromatin packaging uh, is, is advantageous to those cancer cells. Uh, we, we're still trying to work that out. This discovery was made four years ago, and that this, there's a lot of parallel efforts going on to try to work out the mechanism. So do you think that this is the mechanism, maybe T53 or P10 as well? This is different. That's very different. different. So P53 is well known, so it's an apoptotic uh, sure. pathway. This is chromatin modification, so it's different. Talking about the hit of different, uh, does P53 have the same pattern that different mutations offer all across the genome? Yeah, the missense, though, the missense mutations in P53, they're all in the DNA binding domain. You never see missense mutations outside of that. But you'll see frame shifting mutations and stop codon mutations peppered throughout the protein. Okay, so uh, then uh, here's just an example of um, some more hotspots. So uh, this is from that Vogelstein review, uh, and it just shows just a different way of, uh, of displaying. So here's an RB1 tumor suppressor gene. You have mutations spread throughout. There's VHL, another tumor suppressor gene. Again, mutations spread throughout. Uh, but then in, for example, IDH1 mutations and glioblastoma, um, uh, they all are the same locus. Um, and the PI3 kinase have, um, have hotspots. Okay. So again, this and this is from that review. So you probably get a lot of this information that I'm that I'm telling you now just from reading this review. Um, the same concepts are iterated there, uh, and so I really recommend that you, you do read that. Okay. So then, actionable mutations. So there there are a number, um, and and I've listed and talked about some of them already. Um, so so then let's look at uh, beyond genes. So. Uh, there's an emerging concept because of the ability now to sequence whole genomes whereby one can actually look at um, basically uh, summer, summary measurements from looking at mutations across a whole genome that can tell you something about the phenotype acting in that cell and that can tell us about, for example, mutation rates. So how many mutations are in a genome? Um, it's probably an indication of, of maybe, again, what DNA repair proteins are uh, are, are aber aberrated in that in that tumor type, and um, and then this concept of mutational signatures, which is the substitution uh, patterns, um, can tell us something about the mutational mechanism that's operating. So let's first look at uh, 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 that. So the substitution patterns. Um, so 
so this is, a, again, a synthesis of, of several different tumor types. Um, uh, this paper uh, came out last year and, and suggests that, uh, for example, um, here you have uh, lung cancers uh, with a preponderance of, of C to A mutations. Uh, and that's uh, likely due uh, to the insult of, um, of, of tobacco smoke uh, in the lungs. And so that is a specific mutagen that ch changes a, 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 a cytosine um, to, to an adenine. And so, um, and then on the other side of the picture, we have um, uh, our melanomas here, uh, which are C to T enriched. So the vast majority of mutations in melanomas are C to T, and that's uh, a cytosine deamination due to UV exposure. So, so it all makes sense. So you have these environmental insults that create this specific mutation pattern um, that's associated with um, those things. And then, and then you can have um, different endogenous uh, causes for this as well. But uh, what this has really started to do now is, is we can start to classify mutations both by their mutation abundance, which is, which is shown um, kind of in the radial axes going up here, and, and then around this, this donut, um, uh, are the, the actual specific um, substitution patterns. And, and so this is really quite, um, so, so one can start to class mutations as a, as a, as a C to T um, mutations, and it, and it gives us some indication of a, of a mutational mechanism that's operating. Um, and, and so and the number of mutations is, is actually quite interesting as well. And so we can see a, a real uh, variance uh, from tumor type to tumor type. So here's AML, uh, and this is showing the number of mutations uh, per megabase, um, and it's way down here. It's, it's, it has, um, you know, between 0.01 and 1 mutations per megabase. But then you go up to, uh, to the lung cancers, and especially the smokers um, that, uh, that acquired lung cancers have mutations that are more in the, um, more in the, the, the sort of 30 to, 30 to 40 mutations per megabase. So that's, that's several log orders, uh, more mutations going on in the lung cancers than the AMLs. All right. So this has uh, important implications for then um, potentially stratifying tumors. So this was really nicely demonstrated in the, um, in, uh, the endometrial cancer uh, marker paper from the TCGA. And what they found is essentially that you have um, uh, several classes of, uh, of, of tumors. And, and this is really a disease that uh, was considered, these are uterine cancers, and they're, they're sort of considered the same thing. So we take this population and we can treat uh, okay, I have uterine cancer, we're going to treat it in the same way. And they're clearly uh, can be classed into four major subtypes. And, and those subtypes co-segregate with the, the mutation pattern. So here you have um, a class of tumors that have uh, pole E mutations, and that leads to massive numbers of mutations. So, so this is the ultra, ultra hypermutated um, cases. And again, this is on a log scale. Uh, and you can see that uh, the number of mutations per megabase is, is, is upwards of 500 um, in, in these uh, cases, which is way far exceeds um, uh, the, other, the other tumors. And then we have this microsite, microsatellite instability uh, type of mutations. And these have actually different mutational patterns, so the different substitution patterns compared to the ultra-mutated, um, and, uh, and, and then can, can be classed as a, as a different, um, different tumor type. And then you have um, what they're calling copy number low and copy number high. So these ones have few mutations, but they have lots of copy number changes. Okay, so this, this speaks to this idea that typically uh, there's one, muta there's one um, DNA repair abnormality operating in a, in a particular tumor. Um, and and what's, what's really important about this is that these uh, different classes, they actually track with outcomes. So these pole E, ultra-mutated cancers, none of them die. Nobody dies. So they're malignant tumors. Uh, they, they can be cured with surgery, and those patients are fine. So that is very, very different than these copy number high cases, whereby uh, after uh, five years survival, uh, after five years, uh, only 50% of patients are alive. 
So, uh, and, and this is being borne out now. We've, we've actually, um, some colleagues uh, of mine have gone back in and, tr and tried to validate this. And, and it's true. If you look at the outcomes of the cases with polio mutations, um, they all uh, have either died of other causes or they're still alive. So it, it really uh, so it speaks to the ability of looking at the whole genome as, uh, as a way of stratifying uh, patients and with different phenotypes. Okay. All right, so. so I think it's a different phenotype. It usually associated with worse outcomes and most in a lot of diseases. Why would this be associated? No, I, that's actually, I think that's actually was a misconception. I think it's, it's coming out now that um, the, the hypermutative cases are actually um, somehow has a protective effect, or maybe because of immune surveillance, it, it triggers you know, a bigger immune response. Uh, in, in, so I think it's being borne out in several different diseases now where um, uh, somatic hypermutation may have actually a, a protective effect. Um, okay, so this may be a good time to take some questions. Is yep. there a formal classification of hypermutated versus non hypermutated? Is it very disease dependent? Not really. I mean, I think it is disease dependent. And um, th this paper, the CCJ paper, just came out a year and a half ago. So um, I think a lot of people now are working on trying to actually generate uh, clinical diagnostics that could actually, um, you know, subtype these, these, these patients. But it's still in development. It takes, it takes some time. Um, and, and really, I mean, we've only had data sets in research contexts um, to really explore this uh, for the last three, four years. So I think it's going to take some time for that to mature. But eventually, I think, yeah, I should, we should get there. So I know in the TCG paper for colorectal cancer, they classify all the tumors into those two categories, mm -hmm. too. But yeah. I, don't, I don't recall the basis. Um, yes, I, I don't either. Um, typically, these initial marker papers have, have used a lot of... Um, uh, it, t they try to use statistics where possible, but sometimes it's just ad hoc. They make just cutoffs and say, okay, well, this group is above above my line, and so I'm going to classify it as this, and this group is below the line, so classify it as something different. Um, but, um, but one could actually, you, you can imagine, you could easily compute this. Uh, and, and it, but the problem is there's going to be a, spe a continuous spectrum. And so want to discretize that into categories is... is probably should be done with um, being able to ascertain whether there actually is a mismatch repair protein um, abnormality that's yielding those or not. So if you, if you have some cause for it, uh, right. then, then it makes sense. Um, so you have, the nut, you have the high mutation rate, but then if you can have also associate it with a cause in that tumor, then that's a much better yeah. and more reliable way of doing it. All right, so then now let's look at how, uh, how these uh, mutations can be detected in, in primary data. So given this sort of biological overview, and, uh, and now we'll go into um, some of these aspects. So I've already mentioned this in the, in the, in the morning, uh, but I, it's worth reemphasizing. So tumor normal admixture, uh, intratumoral heterogeneity, genomic instability, um, uh, and, and also... Uh, you know, the experimental design to capture mutations is, is quite important. And so this, this really uh, necessitates the, the need, uh, the necess necessitates the development of cancer-specific tools uh, to analyze mutations. So there's a lot of machinery out there to analyze normal genomes, as I said. And, um, you know, so the SAM tools package is probably one of the more cited papers in the last, um, in the last few years because uh, it's so ubiquitous uh, in terms of um, people using it for, um, for, for exploration of, of normal uh, genomes. And uh, in the initial days, a lot of people were using that package to study tumors because there just wasn't anything else out there. So I'm going to sort of go through a history, uh, a recent history of, of how development of somatic mutation detection uh, over time has evolved into now where we have fairly reliable and, and pretty good tools uh, to do this. And, and you'll be looking at some of those tools in the lab. So, of course, the first process uh, is when we, you know, we get FASTQ data off the, off the sequencer, um, it looks something like this, and, it's, and, and so we need to align it um, to a reference sequence, and we get something that looks like this. So, um, 
so what's shown here is just in black are the, 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 the nucleotides that maps the reference, and in red uh, are the positions um, that, that, are, um, uh, that don't match the reference. And, and to get to this stage, uh, you've already probably covered that there's, there's a huge literature in alignment software, and, and a couple of um, pieces of software have, have risen to the fore, um, mostly because they, they, work, they don't crash, I think, more than, than their algorithmic sophistication. Um, they work, and, and people can use them, uh, and, and, and they actually run fast. Uh, by no means is the most popular alignment algorithm the very best algorithm. Um, I would say that the very opposite is true. So uh, uh, there are algorithms such as um, Novo Align, which try to do a principled alignment of all the data, and it probably are yielding much more accurate results. But uh, but nonetheless, the field has adopted um, tools like BWA as as the de facto um, community standard, if you will. So so we we uh, entered into this. Um, this domain of trying to infer mutations from tumor normal uh, genomes or exomes uh, in around the year uh, 2010, and um, and developed two methods uh, that were published. This this method here, joint SMV mix, um, this was actually the first uh, somatic mutation specific uh, variant caller in the literature. Uh, and or one of the first, and it, um, and then we subsequently developed this uh, mutation seek, uh, which has different properties. And um, so I'll, I'll just walk through uh, how we uh, how we came about with the assumptions that we incorporated into these data sets. So so let's begin with um, this first of all this notion that we have uh, two data sets when we when we when we're doing somatic mutation detection. So that right off the bat changes the game completely. Because um, one could analyze, you can imagine you can analyze the tumor exome or genome and the normal exome or genome, and then do some sort of subtractive analysis. You can say, well, um, uh, okay, I'm going to call something somatic if I see it in my mutation list derived from tumor if it's not in my mutation list derived from normal. Well, that turns out to be um, not work very well, and that's because um, when, when we sample uh, these alleles, it's always incomplete. Um, so, so it's a, uh, when we're building a library, for example, for the normal, imagine you have a heterozygous polymorphism here, and that's what's shown in blue. So you have half of your reads that can be projected onto this. Um, so, so the first thing, actually, that we do is we project the nucleotides onto a, a numerics vector space. So where we, we call um, A is the number of reads that uh, support the reference, and D is the depth. And so that's the total number of reads at a given position. And so then we try to, uh, 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 we can then use these numbers because they uh, allow us to use really nice standard um, statistical frameworks like binomial distributions. So it's, you can think about it as coin flipping, okay? So you're going to flip a coin many times and it can get heads or tails. And, and the bias of that coin, so let's say you have a very biased coin in, in terms of heads, uh, will reveal a pattern that, um, that whereby most of the observations will be heads. Uh, and if you see 50-50, then you can imagine that that's going to be um, a, a really unbiased coin. That might represent a heterozygous position. Um, and, and so you can start to model this by, um, by standard uh, statistical distributions. But the most important thing here is that, in fact, these two data sets are highly correlated. And most of the variant positions are going to be germline polymorphisms that are actually shared in both the tumor and the normal. And, and so, so the somatic mutation rate is far less than, than the uh, germline polymorphism rate of the genome. So it may be several log orders less, in fact. So you may see only a, a somatic mutation rate that's one, one one thousandth of the germline uh, variation rate. And so one can take advantage of that and start to try to borrow statistical strength from these highly correlated data sets. Uh, and so, so that's what we did in this, um, in, in, in this algorithm. And we took these allelic count measurements and, uh, and then we're able to classify them into, into essentially nine different groups. And that's um, by taking the cross product of the genotype state space in the tumor and the normal. And, and then try to infer uh, 
given the output of the counts, what is the most likely state to have given rise to that data? So here you can see the red one, you have um, all the reads are uh, are reference in the normal, but then you have um, half the reads are variant in the tumor. And this is the type of signal that we're trying to find here. Um, and so uh, that port that corresponds to uh, AAAB uh, in that table there, and that that's gets the, the highest probability, if you will. So uh, so this was rolled into a statistical model called joint SAV mix, and uh, and and you can read about the gory details. But um, this is a generative probabilistic model that tries to simultaneously analyze these two data sets uh, in order to um, to determine uh, this genotype state space. So uh, we don't have time to really dig into this, but just to say that um, treating the data simultaneously gives us tremendous advantage than treating them independently, which is what most people were doing at the time. Uh, and that's borne out in accuracy metrics. Yeah. This is exome data, yeah. Uh, but then, actually, we we did some um, evaluation on um, on actually these are these are actually genome scales. So this is eleven uh, diffuse large B cell lymphomas that we did the accuracy metrics on, and in both the germline case and the and and the somatic case, uh, we were able to um, to do a better job than than if we were to look at the data sets independently. And again, I'll refer you to the paper for um, for that. So. So then we got faced with an issue because um, we thought we had really um, cracked cracked a nut on uh, on this problem, but then uh, did uh, an analysis on uh, on our this triple negative breast cancer data set that we had generated, uh, and and we called uh, three thousand mutations using this method, and um, the majority of them actually didn't validate as being real. So so that that. That was a bit of a problem. Um, so we did better than we did before, but uh, this is still pretty bad. Um, so so we thought, thought, well, okay, what can we learn from this? And um, and and the and so you can see uh, here that uh, allelic counts. So I you know showed this picture of projecting onto allelic counts. It's completely insufficient given the noise in the in this in the system. So so here you have, um, for example. A case where you have reads at harbor variants in this top. Uh, this is the tumor sample up here. This is a normal sample down here, and you can see that there, there is this nice signal uh, of mutations in the tumor, not in the normal. And so this was caused. This was called as a mutation, uh, but we went to validate it, and it turned out not to be um, the case. And and you can take these reads actually, and. Um, they align almost equally well to other places in the genome. So this is actually a misalignment um, due, induced by this, this variant here. And so these reads actually don't belong at this locus. They belong somewhere else. So that's one way from which we can get false positives. Yeah? So you, you mean validation by bed bed Resequencing. Yeah. Um, here is a, a set of uh, false positives that are induced by indels. So, so here is a, probably a germline indel um, that's here, and and you can see. Uh, so, so you've had you had some exposure to IgV already, right? So okay, all right, good. So, so this is what an indel looks like, and you can see that in these three reads, um, basically the indel is not getting placed properly, and it's causing the tail of these reads to be um, to be put in the wrong place. And, and that, if you just, again, you're just looking at this particular position, um, it looks pretty good. It looks like there are, there are these three reads here with a the mutation. These, uh, these reads here in the normal don't have any evidence of the mutation. Um, it looks fairly good. But if you look at the context, uh, you can see there's all kinds of noise around it. And it's very likely just a, a, a misincorporation of an indel in those reads that's giving rise to that signal. Yeah? I'm sorry, this is after you run the mutation seek and GAT. This is this is just uh, alignment of BWA. So this isn't local realignment or anything like that. Yeah. Okay. So here's an example whereby um, you have very. It's probably hard to see, but um, maybe it came out in the printed page. Is you have uh, very low quality uh, substitutions here. So th there are uh, several reads with a mutation here in the tumor, not in the normal, and um, uh, but but they're they're very low base quality. So so in fact. This is uh, the machine, the Illumina base collar, 
uh, is not very confident in those in those bases there. So it's probably a sequencing error that's given rise to those. Okay. Um, and then, then we have the example of, um, of, of something called strand bias. And, and this is due to um, all the reads that are containing the variant are sequenced in the same direction. So you do not see bidirectional evidence of the variant. It's a very likely an artifact due to PCR, uh, allele-specific PCR, or something like that. Okay. Uh, and then you have examples like this. So he, this one, sorry, I've, I've inverted the, the tumor in the wrong. This is the tumor. That's the normal. So this one, there's really nothing to explain it. There are no indels. You have a nice balanced strand bias. Uh, you don't have uh, low base quality. They're high base quality. You don't have um, evidence of misalignment. Uh, but this is a mutation that was predicted but not validated. And this could speak to maybe the validation technology is not perfect either. Uh, and but um, but there's something about about those um, that uh, are maybe not explained. So so this really prompted um, some uh, some some head scratching, and we thought, well, um, what can we do to learn from this experience? We've got this nice labeled data set. Can we use uh, classification-based tools to learn something about the features that give rise to to false positive versus true positive mutations? So, um, and and in fact, we had true positive examples that had very very low um, uh, uh, signal as well, but but these turn out to validate. And so, even this one here, you have maybe just two reads that um, show um, show evidence of the mutation, um, and uh, but this one turned out to be to be real. So, so we embarked on uh, this project called Mutation Seek, um, and whereby we extracted uh, and computed features of the data. And uh, so, in the initial paper, um, we calculated 40 features from the tumor, 40 features from the normal, and then created 26 joint features, uh, which were mostly ratios of tumor to normal um, and sums across tumor and normals. And these included things like base quality, mapping quality, the presence of homopolymer runs, strand bias, as I've already said, et cetera. And, and this was uh, similar in concept to the GATK's VQSR, uh, but, but we, here we use tumor and normal simultaneously. And so by computing these 106 features, um, if you just project those onto, um, onto the, uh, uh, using principal component analysis onto the three major principal components, um, you can s and then color the data points according to whether they're somatic, germline, or wild type, you can see that there really is a, actually a nice separation that can be achieved. Of um, The majority of the somatics can be separated from the other two classes. So, uh, so then uh, this gave us some confidence that we should be able to then determine a classifier using these features that can, um, that we should be able to learn a classifier that can distinguish these that goes well beyond just allelic count modeling, which was done in, in joint S and mix. So, so we embarked on this, and uh, and then uh, through cross validation analysis, uh, um, we're able to demonstrate that um, this this type of approach far exceeds um, the other uh, uh, the standard at the time, which was to use either SAM tools or GATK, um, and uh, we'll get very nice. This is a receiver operating characteristic curve that's showing sensitivity plotted against. Um, uh, against specificity, and uh, and we're achieving very very good results. So much much better than that thirty percent validation rate in the first uh, in the first round. So so this uh, this allowed us um, uh, some confidence to move forward. Uh, and then what we did is we then went back and tried to explain. So what is giving rise to these false positives? And, and we clustered the data according to these features. And we found that um, there were several characteristics of, of, of different classes of false positives. So in this group one, we found that they were uh, induced by strand bias, um, <coughs> unequal mapping qualities in the tumor and normal, and, uh, and low confidence uh, or low, low confidence genotypes. Then we had another group that was associated with um, uh, and this is this is a common thing that happens is is in the context of GGT trinucleotides often get the misincorporation of a G base um, instead of a T, and so this group here was was characterized by that. Um, and then we had uh, another group that was um, uh, due to misalignments and repetitive sequence. Uh, another group that had uh, low base quality but also had the GGT to GGG error, um, and then. Um, uh, this was a group that, that actually, so if you look at this profile, this heat map, here are the somatic mutations down here, and then this group actually has a profile that's very similar to the somatic mutations across these features, uh, except 
um, there are very, very weak signals of the variant in the normal. So, so it suggests that these are probably um, miscalled germlines uh, most of the time, uh, and, and actually should be called, uh, they should be called germline and not somatic. So we have these different classes for explaining false positives. So you can see, uh, the, the point of why I'm showing you this is that the, the mutation calling is a complex uh, uh, process actually. So, so we think it's it's quite simple. We just take count the number of alleles in the tumor and the normal, and we say, okay, that's a somatic mutation. Um, the machine artifacts actually vastly outweigh the biological noise of germline polymorphisms in the data. Uh, and so, uh, so a number of groups have, you know, this is kind of a parallel journey of discovery, if you will, that was happening probably at 10 different centers around the world. Uh, and, and, and this is our effort here uh, that was used um, in that context. Okay, so how are we doing for time? We'll break at three? Oh, we've got plenty of time. Okay. Yes? Um, so how do you actually use this, uh, this algorithm? You first call all the mutations that you can, and then you classify yeah. them? No, good, good question. So this is a classic, um, you need a training set. It's a training set, learn the classifier, and then apply to, uh, to a test set or some new data. But, so, but you already have the training set. Yeah, so, you, so we release the training, the, the result of the training as part of the, the, the software package. So as part of the software package, you get a model. That model is derived from um, essentially learning the classifier on, on, on label data like this. Yeah. Yeah. So we've actually, since that's 3,000 mutations, we've since actually added a, uh, about 10,000 more mutations. So it's now trained on 13,000 or so label data and it's, sets. It's, it's improved the, the... Yeah, it gets a little bit better every time. Sometimes a little bit worse. <laughs> but, 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 but still, your... your um, I don't know how this algorithm is called, but you call all the mutation, all the mutations, and then you classify them with mutation C. Oh, I see. Um, yeah. So, so the initial training set was was derived by just applying joint S and V mix, okay. and, and basically using naive ways to, um, to to call mutations. And then we went and actually experimentally validated. So that's still joint S and V mix, still un unlabeled data. Then we went and did the experiment to get reliable labels on all this data. Once we have the labels, it, it, it makes it amenable to learning the classifier using just, it actually ran it for us to be the best um, approach to use in the, in the domain. So you can, but you can use any kind of discriminative classifier, logistic regression, random forest, uh, Bayesian additive regression trees, what, what, what have you, on naive ways. The point is that if you use all these features, it improves things. Yeah. It's the classifier method is less important. You, you used the uh, pre-existing naive tools also to create a mutation C. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. In the program? Yeah. Oh, so what? So when you actually run the program, it just runs from the tumor normal band file. So, so when you're when you and you'll see this in the lab. So when you actually go to run the, run the program, um, you literally just the inputs are the tumor band file, the normal band file, and the output is a, a BCF file that contains the somatic mutations, and they have a probability associated with them. So you can use, a, um, you can use that, qual that as a quality score to, to filter off low probability mutations. So we can use it for every exome sequence, every exome sequence data? Yeah, in a tumor normal capacity. Yeah. 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 Have you seen a dependence on that? Yeah, so, so, I mean, obviously that if you don't sample a, a, a mutation due to depth, you're going to miss it, right? I mean, it's just uh, certainly um, depth plays a role. Uh, but, but we're able to find um, mutations at uh, 30x that are in the range of 10% allele fraction, so three reads. Yeah, I would worry about the other way. If I have 500 depth and I'm picking up very low percentage of variants that yeah. wouldn't have anything in your body. Sure, sure. I think you need to, you, you, that, that would be a case where uh, it would be useful to, to train on de high depth data, uh, which we actually have a lot of because we've done rese targeted resequencing. Um, and one of the future rollouts is to have a, a deep um, a, a deep mode uh, where, where you do have this high depth. And it's really for panels because um, you get yeah. 500x and 
uh, or even some people are doing exomes at 500x. So, uh, yeah, no, that's a good point. Absolutely. So, so the vast majority of this is is um, trained on exome or genome at about 50x coverage, and and we really tried to. The, our motivation for my own lab is that I was generating a lot of genome data and, and wanted a, a tool that could work on, on genome data and for which I understood you know, every step of the, the analysis process. A lot of the times you download third-party software and, and it just doesn't match up with, with the paper sets and um, so you, it, it becomes impossible to really interpret exactly what the outputs are. So, uh, so from my perspective, I need to deconstruct everything right down to the mathematical um, assumptions and make sure that's implemented exactly as I expect. Um, that's not going to be the case for everyone in this room, um, but maybe the case for some of you in the room. Uh, but um, but that's, that was what was important to me. And so so I've, I've invested a lot of time and developer time into, into creating a package that we can use and interpret um, in a meaningful way. So, Mm -hmm. the, yeah. the, the various callers reward things in different ways when they're making the calls. Yeah. Yeah. And so your a random forest, for example, will, out of the 40 or whatever features you, it'll tell you which ones have the most sort of weight Correct. discriminating. That's right. Are there particular ones that stood out at the top? Yeah, so, uh, so again, things like um, strand bias. Um, we have a feature called cro that we call cross entropy, which is essentially um, the amount of entropy that exists uh, across um, uh, across uh, all the reads, uh, and that that turns out to be quite important. Um, and then, uh, of course, the the likelihood uh, models um, from these binomial type of tests um, uh, and these binomial distributions tends to be quite important. And that, but that, those take into account the depth essentially, right? So, so the more uh, observations, the more peak the likelihood is. Uh, in those uh, statistical distributions, so uh, and that it actually breaks down at some point because you have an, in binomial modeling. Of course, you have that parameter that says this is the expectation of seeing a particular um, uh, the the event, which is the variant. Um, and then once you get lots of observations, small deviations away from that expectation actually result in very low likelihoods. So that's that has that's undesirable. So so one can actually use over dispersed um, type of distributions to accommodate for that, um, and we've had to do that on occasion. Okay. Yeah. How, how correlated is your the twenty six features? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. So so some of them are some of them are highly correlated. Yeah. yeah they're not um, they're not all independent. So so you know that for example, um, mapping quality is actually related to base quality because. Um, mapping quality incorporates base quality into its uh, into its ability to eliminate. Um, so, so there are some some that are highly correlated. And how did you assess the importance? So, so random forest essentially uh, outputs uh, feature importance based on um, the stochastic resampling of the trees, and and asks you know in the in that resampling the trees how often a, a feature is uh, is at the top of the tree for discriminative capacity. So it's essentially like creating um, decision trees uh, in different ways uh, at multiple, at multiple times in, in the random distribution of that decision tree and then can ask how often we get a, a, a meaningful split on a particular feature. And so then we can summarize that and rank those features according to how often that occurs. And so that's what we do. In fact, we've then, the, t the ones in the tail of the distribution, we've actually now just, just removed them because they consistently um, are, are not important, and so it reduces the complexity of the algorithm. But I think that it's, uh, the random course is a little bit biased towards um, the correlated features. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So that there are ways to then to then post-process that, and, uh, or even run it in a, in a. So ultimately, you can imagine that um, you could run. Uh, you, you could actually do a Bayesian structure learning. So you have a you want to learn actually a. a, a a complete um, Bayesian network to uh, to cope with this. We haven't gone to that length yet, but that would be the best way to go about it. But but what we've learned from this is that the vast majority of the gain is just in computing the features in yeah. the first place, and then the method of classification becomes less important. Yeah. yeah. So these are pretty remarkable graphs. Mm -hmm. 
is that on the training data? Or on this is in cross-validation, and then we actually, in the paper, you'll see that there's a test set that was held out. And was it and static it, data that it's validated on? It, it, it's just a held out set um, that, that we never actually trained on or touched um, from that perspective. With real tumor data? Though? Yeah, and actually, so this is tr primarily trained on, morph on exomes, and that data was on genomes, even on a different platform, so solid uh, platform genomes. And despite that, we still got um, not quite this good, but uh, result, but pretty good results. Much better than than what was before. So you're still gonna win the green challenge. Well, we're not. We're not in first place. <laughs> so probably not. But but I think the dream challenge is too synthetic. To be honest. Real stage at the end. Yeah, there is a real stage at the end. Um, we're in there. We're in the top five or something like that. But. Yeah, a lot of a lot of groups have, have put out nice software packages. That this is really for educational purposes meant to be uh, about the concepts. So one needs to take into all these features into account, and and there are different software packages out there which which we'll point to uh, later on that um, that are much more popular than our own tool. We use it internally um, because of the reasons I stated. I like to understand from the very raw data all the way through to an output how that was calculated. Um, so I can have my own confidence in that, but there are software packages that do a good job of this. So are there any actionable items from the findings of this classifier that you can set back into sort of the alignment software? Oh yeah, that's a, that's a really excellent uh, point. Uh, so so we're working, um, we, I have a tight collaboration with Paul Boutros. Um, some of you may, are, anybody from Paul's lab here? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, and, and, and so we're trying to actually uh, answer exactly that question. So, so what are the best practices uh, in terms of for taking a whole genome and, and finding mutations um, and doing rigorous benchmarking, which is, um, so Dream Challenge is one way. Um, and then the TCGA and ICDC have their own internal um, benchmarking efforts that are underway. And, uh, and so the intent is to actually is to do exactly that. Just keep feeding in new new features and then rerunning um, these benchmark data sets. Um, and hopefully the um, the amount of validation and ground truth data will grow over time, such that, such that you know essentially um, it, there will become the, there will be some parity across all of the mutation callers, and then we can just put it to bed and work on something else. <laughs> okay. Good. So how are we doing? I think we're getting there. Let's see. Yeah, okay. So I can go through the last part pretty quickly. Um, let's just talk about some available tools. So I already mentioned um, uh, SAM tools. And, uh, and, and like I said, um, this is, has some very, very nice um, uh, nice community standards associated with it. Um, uh, you know, I think I think Heng Lee, who developed this, um, should should get a, a nice award sometime soon for uh, a massive contribution to the field. And uh, he's just a really good contributor, uh, and has made all of his code and uh, uh, completely open to the public. And so I think we're all a great benefit um, benefit from this. So that's good. Um, here's the GATK uh, toolkit from the Broad. Uh, and, and this has some nice features in terms of um, fixing alignments, if you will, so through local realignment and, and, uh, and things like that. Um, and then uh, one of the more popular tools uh, for somatic mutation detection is Mutect. And this, is, this comes out of the Broad Institute as well. Uh, and, and you can see here that um, there are a number of uh, concepts that, uh, that overlap. Um, we have uh, things like uh, in, in insertions and deletions, proximal gaps, as they call them, strand bias, uh, mappability, uh, um, things like um, uh, uh, a triallelic site, and then uh, what the distribution of the tumor to normal allele counts. So, so all of these concepts um, uh, we've published in, in various capacities, and, and this has all been now rolled into a, a very nice uh, piece of software that's that's been used to drive a lot of the TCJ um, uh, data sets that are out there are probably um, a resultant of uh, of Mutect. 
Uh, and they did some nice benchmarking um, to show the sensitivity of the algorithm um, according to sequencing depth and also according to expected uh, variant frequency. Uh, and that's just shown. So, so if you want to learn more about this, you can read their paper. Um, another uh, effort uh, that has come online uh, is Strelka. Uh, I think this was published just soon after um, uh, Mutation Seek. Uh, and this actually comes right out of Illumina. And um, this is where you can get the software. And, and this is the, the sort of workflow that, um, that, that is. And it's a nice piece of software, produces VCF files from BAM. Um, and, uh, and I think you'll, you'll use it in the lab um, coming up. Um, so one of the things that for mutation seed that we've been really um, trying to capture is uh, this phenomenon of can uh, the genome as a whole be used uh, as, as, as something uh, uh, that we can actually classify or use as a phenotype. And so we've been working on visualization techniques for, to accompany um, our software. And, um, and what you can see here uh, is, for example, allele ratio as a function of coverage. And, and this really shows a density of data points. So this is over 4,000 data points in this particular tumor. And you can see that there are these different clusters. And, and one can make the uh, uh, assumption that these actually represent different clonal populations that are at different abundances uh, in the cell. And so, uh, so that gives us a, a sort of a global picture of that. And then we also calculate this substitution profile. So these are tri-nucleotide contexts. And, and this gives us a picture of, of maybe what mutational mechanisms may be operating in that cell. And then finally, um, uh, we look at the density of mutations across the genome. You can see it's highly non-uniform. Um, and, and this has been reported before that um, there are parts of the genome that are more mutable than others. Um, and there are lots of literature on that. So here's, a, here's a, a, an example of how you can use these uh, profiles, these mutation portraits, if you will, to, uh, to do quality control. So this is a, a follicular and lymphoma sample that we sequenced. And you can see that there's a huge enrichment for C to A um, mutations. And, and this is, um, this is uh, not expected in this tumor type at all. And, and in fact, they're all associated with very, very low uh, allele ratio uh, variants. And, uh, and so there's a paper, um, uh, again, um, put out by the Broad that suggests that um, there's oxidation of DNA that can happen during oversonication of libraries. And that induces um, this substitution, the C to A substitution. So, so we think that this is actually a complete artifact. 90% of these mutations are, are due to this artifact. So, so this is a way of, uh, of QCing. Hopefully, you catch this before you sequence. But in this case, uh, we already did all the work um, and, and found this. Sorry, so that software incorporates that? Mm -hmm. They have. Um, they did release a piece of software that can um, that can actually uh, um, remove those, um, but but what what this is just doing is visualizing the data as it is. So so you can take this whole genome profile, uh, the mutation seek software, and then visualize it. And you'll do this in the lab as well. So you can take a, a VCF file and output this thing. And when you look at this, this should raise alarm bells right away. That that this is probably a bad library. Yeah. What is that? Oh, it's, it's an enrichment of C to A mutations over here, yeah. And it, and it corresponds to very, very low allele ratio. So here it's somewhere around 10% or less. And that's that's the signature that they found. Yeah. Have you uh, seen similar types of profiles when looking at FFPE? Uh, we haven't really done a whole lot of FFPE genomes. Um, pro I, I would assume that that would be the case. Um, but... but um, we typically work with frozen material. Yeah. Um, so, so we'll go over VCF format in the lab. Um, uh, there's a there's a nice um, web page here that that talks about um, the GATK's VCF format. VCF format variant calling format um, is rather loose uh, format. I would wouldn't I would hesitate to even call it a format, but it does have some common characteristics in the sense that it has a chromosome, a position. Um, you can have an ID for that particular position that could be a SNP. Um, you have the, the reference base, the alternate base, and then a series of different um, uh, characteristics. So in mutation seek, these characteristics are, for example, um, the probability of somatic mutation, um, the count, uh, the allele count of the tumor, um, the reference alleles, alternate alleles, the counts of the normal reference, 
the alternate uh, allele in the normal, the trinucleotide context, and then we actually output the number of uh, proximal insertions and deletions because that, that tends to be uh, a real, um, uh, 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 really wreak havoc on, on the... Um, on the actual uh, thing, and then we have uh, a, a threshold on the probability of positive call, and this is this is end up this is what it ends up looking like. Uh, so you'll explore this uh, in the lab as well. Uh, and so here you can see the trinucleotide context. You can see the different counts, um, and then here's the probability. What's proximal? Uh, so in the same read. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, and then, so here's just a list of, um, of software that's available out there for somatic mutation detection. Um, it, they, these are all packages that, that work, they run, um, they have various quality. I would say that um, probably Strelka, sorry, I haven't put Strelka here, but it's in the other slide. Strelka, Mutech, and MutationSeq are, are, are performing um, somewhat similarly uh, and, and all much better than, for example, somatic sniper and joint SMB mix. Um, and, and in the dream challenge, actually, the uh, Mutech, uh, Mutech is blowing everybody away. Um, but I think it's, again, because um, that's really synthetic data. Um, OK, so we have visualization tools, IGV. Uh, and then we have annotation tools. Yeah? If you don't have a control? Uh, don't sequence. <laughs> yeah, uh, I wouldn't sequence. Um, it's, I mean, the somatic mutation signal is buried in 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 um, one one thousandth of the variance, right? So, so you may get lucky, but otherwise, um, I, I just wouldn't do it. Wouldn't do it. Study a different tumor. Um, okay. Uh, not necessarily. I mean, if if you have contact with the patient, the patient's still alive. If the patient consents, then great. Yeah, I'm saying. That yeah, the but uh, that's easier said than done. You can't just say I can always draw blood. I would say you can rarely draw blood. And yeah. then you can use blood if you have. Well, you, you should. So, yeah, for brain and stuff. If you, if you don't have matched normals from. The brain. Oh yeah, you don't need matched normal tissue. Exactly. You just need matched normal exactly. DNA. Yeah, yeah. But I think I think you're talking about if you don't have any source of matched normal DNA. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so very quickly going through the uh, advanced and future topics. So, um, what's our time? I think we're out of time probably. But uh, okay, you gonna can you give me five minutes? Five more minutes to wrap up. All right. So uh, one of the very very important concepts of next gen sequencing is not just its ability to uh, broadly sequence across the genome in in, in high throughput but rather um, uh, the digital capacity of uh, uh, measuring alleles. So, uh, so what we have here is uh, we have a pool of DNA. And, um, and, and again, this, is, this comes from a mixture of populations uh, in, a, in a particular sample. So this mixture may only harbor, for example, let's say 20% of the, of the cells may harbor a particular mutation. When we get the readout, um, the, the reads will harbor the uh, mutations in relative proportion to uh, the source material in the first place. And so this is, this is often underappreciated, but if we do very deep sequencing, we can get very precise estimates of the allele counts uh, of a particular mutation. And we can use that uh, to, uh, to make inferences about how these populations may be shifting over time. Um, and and we've, sh we've shown some of that work uh, in, in a couple of different studies. Um, so, so this this is now. Um, so, I like to break this down into into three experimental designs where this can really be leveraged. The first is is deep analysis of a single sample, where one tries to reconstruct a population structure from measuring these alleles uh, in multiple different loci. Um, you can imagine that. Uh, so, this is this multi-region sampling idea that I showed Charlie Swanton's paper. We published a paper last year in ovarian cancer um, that that use a similar strategy. And then, uh, and then the last is in time series. So if you have a primary tumor, uh, and then, then you're lucky enough, or uh, the patient is unfortunately unlucky enough to, to relapse, 
and we can study that relapse biopsy, um, then one can actually start to make inferences about how these clonal populations have changed uh, in the context of therapy. Um, and this can also be done in model systems such as xenografts, um, where, where, where um, patient tumor material is engrafted into mice, and then we can follow how those populations change uh, in, in mice in the context of drug selection experiments. So, uh, so this is, this is a, a, a sort of breakdown of these different experimental designs. But when we measure a particular mutation uh, very deeply at a particular locus, so, so here they have this A mutation here, um, and this can be done through PCR followed by uh, deep sequencing. Um, this arises from a, from a multiple um, set, set of factors. And, and the first is, includes the amount of normal cell contamination. And then we have this notion that uh, the mutation may only be present in a subpopulation of cells. Okay, and that's an unknown quantity. And so that will give rise to that, um, that observation as well. And then we have this uh, concept of the mutational genotype. So this is really where copy number um, really can come into play to help interpret uh, genomes and uh, sort of mutations. So here you have a, 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 an instance of a diploid um, heterozygous mutation. Um, here is a, a homozygous mutation, and so the difference in allele fraction should be between 50% and 100%. But then you may have a case where you have an allele-specific amplification, um, and, and that could yield uh, an allele fraction of 25%. So if you have four copies and one gets mutated, then, then that's going to yield an allele fraction of 25%. So how do we take all this? And, and deconvolute it into actually um, trying to estimate the proport So the, the goal here would be to estimate the proportion of cells harboring a particular mutation from that allele uh, fraction. And, uh, and so we've developed a, a method called PyClone, uh, which is a Bayesian probabilistic model. Uh, again, uh, for, for the, um, the statistically inclined, you can read about it. It's published now in Nature Methods. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail, except to say that we, we, we incorporate these three major concepts of, cellular pre uh, of the cellular contamination of normal cells, um, copy number at the locus, and then try to estimate from that um, uh, the a proportion of cells that are likely to harbor a particular mutation. So, so that has implications for how we interpret these mutations in terms of their evolutionary history. So we have to go back to the introduction of the lecture now. So we're trying to put this into context of evolution. Here you have uh, the output of the algorithm, which shows uh, the inferred um, cellular prevalence of a mutation on the x-axis. And then these are, the these are each of the mutations that we try to cluster together. And you can see that they cluster into these uh, different waves, if you will, of clonal expansion, whereby we have um, those three mutations on the left are very likely to be in the initiating clone because they're in the majority of cells. So these would be the truncal mutations at the root of the tree, if you will. Uh, and then you have these subsequent acquisition of mutations over time. Uh, and so this algorithm allows us to infer this. And we can start to relate this into the uh, presumed phylogenetic progression uh, over time. And, and so we've done some um, extensive benchmarking of the algorithm where we had synthetic mixtures um, and try to re re recapitulate what the mixture uh, should be. And here's the ground truth um, that show the expected prevalence of, of particular mutations. Um, and, and then this is our, our uh, estimate of that um, over time. So, uh, so, so then the, the output of this can, can be viewed as follows. So here's just an example of a time series experiment where we have a tumor uh, allelic prevalence. Um, this is just the allele, allele fraction uh, on the x-axis and the allele fraction of, of a xenograft uh, from that same tumor over time. And so you'd expect that these mutations, if they were, um, if they were uh, constant or preserved in the xenograft, they'd all sort of lie on the diagonal like this, um, where, where they'd be highly correlated. But you see that there are mutations in the axes. And, um, and that suggests here, you, that really does suggest that there's a clone in the tumor that does not expand in the xenograft. And you have a clone in the xenograft here that's expanded from a very minor clone in the tumor. Um, and so, so then uh, we can run this through our algorithm, and we get a picture that looks something like this. And, and so this suggests that all these gray mutations are, uh, are the ancestral mutations that are common to both the tumor and the xenograft. And then you have um, these events on the axes that really uh, suggest either clones that were never engrafted or clones that, um, uh, rare clones in the tumor that expanded over time. So you can imagine doing this over multiple series and, uh, and, and, try, and, and able to track mutations as they evolve uh, in different populations. Okay, 
so last topic uh, is is really uh, an exciting new field. I think for this is um, using similar ideas where we can deep sequence a particular mutation, um, and and this is uh, to to uh, develop liquid biopsies uh, using plasma, um, whereby we know that a tumor might have a particular mutation, uh, and then uh, there's some um, treatment that's administered. And then we can try to monitor um, the patient uh, through through uh, draws of blood, and then uh, and then pla and and extract the DNA, cell free DNA from the plasma. And the idea is that um, tumors will shed their DNA uh, when those cells apoptose into the circulation. And for particular point mutations like KRAS, for example, um, because you know exactly what that mutation is going to be. You can look for that mutation in the presence of the cell-free DNA in the plasma over time and use this as a non-invasive monitoring tool for a surrogate for tumor burden. And, and what this, this paper showed is that, um, that the, uh, the cell-free DNA showed um, evidence of a tumor relapse uh, an approximately nine months in advance of imaging. So it's a highly sensitive way of, in certain contexts, of monitoring uh, relapse in, in, in response. So, so, so this is just a way that a mutation can be used as a biomarker in a liquid biopsy um, to measure relapse. And, uh, and it uses this concept of deep sequencing of, of particular mutations. If this is the reference here. You, you should go look at it. Um, here, here you have uh, an example of, uh, in a different paper, um, whereby uh, this is a breast cancer that harbored a P53 mutation and a PI3 kinase mutation. You can see that um, upon administration of paclitaxel, this clone that had the PI3 kinase mutations, and this is just using cell-free DNA, um, uh, is basically extinguished over time. It rebounds at some point, but, but um, the paclitaxel had an effect on the clone harboring the PI3 kinase mutation. And essentially, you could, uh, this could be... Um, extracted from um, looking at the deep sequencing of these alleles in cell-free DNA extracted from plasma. So I think this is a really promising new area uh, whereby um, one can envision developing um, liquid non-invasive biopsies uh, to monitor tumor progression over time. Uh, so with that, I think I'll, I'll conclude. And, um, and just to say that uh, you know, if we go back to Peter Noel, uh, <laughs> this is really quite amazing. So he says that the acquired genetic instability and associated selection process most readily recognized cytogenetically results in advanced human malignancies being highly individual, both karyotypically and biologically. Hence, each patient's cancer may require individual specific therapy. Um, and even this may be thwarted by emergence of genetically resistant subline. And more research should be directed towards understanding and controlling the evolutionary process in tumors uh, before it reaches the late stage usually seen in clinical cancer. There's a couple of really important concepts here. First is that individualized treatment. Well, that's probably best done by mutation profiling. Um, and then this idea of resistance, um, well, that, that invokes uh, evolution. And so, so we need to be able to model evolutionary processes in these cancers. Um, as, as they're on treatment. And, and maybe CTDNA, CTDNA analysis is going to be the way to do that. Um, they, they may, the, the remarkable thing about this statement here is that um, none of this technology, measurement technology, was been available to, uh, to, to scientists in this era. Um, and yet here we are. And, and so I think we can actually make this uh, a reality as we go forward in the next few years. Um, may not work. There'll be some, there'll be lots of problems along the way, but I, th I think in some patients we'll be able to help them for sure. So with that, um, I think I'm done for the day, and I'd just like to thank, um, I thank you all for listening, and uh, a, a lot of um, the ideas that I've um, presented to you are a result of uh, working with uh, a lot of uh, very talented graduate students, such as Andrew, uh, and where we've had lots of great discussions about how we move the field forward in terms of cancer genome informatics, uh, and a lot of the funding agencies that have provided support for my work over the time. So, conclude there. Thank you very much.